Mr. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Also, also, first of all, I wanted to speak in this debate because, whilst I agree with the general principles of the Visitor Levy Bill, uh, there are aspects I do believe need to be amended, and I'm going to come on to those points uh, in a little bit more detail later. Uh, but I do want to put on record my support for the bill, uh, as it certainly will enable councils to invest in their areas. And that is, of course, only if councils choose to introduce a levy, which can be also be applied to certain areas within a council boundary, rather than the whole local authority footprint itself. Now, furthermore, local authorities can work with neighbouring councils to implement a joint levy, which should help streamline the administration and make it easier for visitors if there are tourism hotspots that cross local authority boundaries. And also, councils could also decide on when to apply the levy, for example, all year round or just during the summer. Uh, this demonstrates to me how, how the bill seeks to empower local authorities by offering that flexibility to meet the local needs. Now, let's also not forget that taxes on overnight tourist stays are, are not unheard of. In fact, they are common across Europe and in other locations around the world. And something uh, Daniel Johnson touched upon this earlier on in his contribution. Now, this suggests that other nations agree that it is reasonable for regions uh, to want to uh, offer small contributions from tourists. Uh, to help support and sustain the visitor economies. And I do not believe that such policies have led to a dearth of people visiting these countries. Mm -hmm. also, Scotland is an exceptionally popular tourist destination. And from conversations I've had with businesses in the tourism sector, we have seen a surge in visits from North America and also visits from China that are expected to recover uh, to the UK. Well, now that the UK is now back on the approved list as of July 2023, and I'm, I'm told that, that these are not particularly cost-conscious markets. And while they, they enjoy visiting the Highlands, they tend to be, to be day visits, and they, they, they do not typically stay in rural accommodation. I make this point as a reminder that the Visitor Levy Bill is, not just, it's a, it's just one means of supporting Scotland's tourism industry. And as it's up to each local authority whether it's introduced, the benefits may not be felt equally across the country. Now, that's why, if this bill is passed, and I certainly hope it is, the engagement with the sector must continue so that we can ensure the tourism offering across Scotland is able to thrive. Also, at the outset, I mentioned aspects of the proposed legislation which I believe should be amended. Specific specifically, I'm not referring to marinas and moorings uh, being categorised as overnight accommodation and therefore captured by the bill. Now, as the chair of the cross-party group on recreational boating and marine tourism, this issue was brought to my attention shortly after the, the bill was published. And this is because marinas and moorings are not providing accommodation. The boat is, in fact, the accommodation, assuming that it actually has the capacity to offer accommodation. But crucially, not every single boat does. Now, in that sense, marinas and moorings are more akin to a car park rather than the accommodation. And those are not my words, those are words of people within the sector. Now, plus, there is the question of who is expected to differentiate between boats, uh, which can be used for overnight stays, and those that can't. And as many small moorings that are community-led, it's staffed by volunteers and have honesty boxes rather than an office to actually manage the things. Two seconds. Now, also, many are small in size, that this, that this generally do not generate much revenue. Daniel Johnson. I, I'm grateful to the member for giving way and grateful for him to going into some detail on this point. Another point on the moorings is that very often moorings actually don't have people on the vessels that are moored to them and therefore actually determining when it's occupied or not it is a, seems like an utter minefield. I wonder if the member would agree with that point. Stuart McMillan. So I'm about to come on to, to that. Um, so so uh, this is why I, mean, I was engaging with the, the Community Wealth Minister on this. In the first meeting with him last summer, uh, before visiting, um, sorry, inviting him to, along to the cross-party group meeting last September to speak with members of the CPG. Uh, this was a very much a helpful discussion, but it's clear that further dialogue was required. And so in November, I hosted a round table with the Minister and relevant stakeholders in my constituency to discuss their concerns in more detail. And the point that Daniel Johnson just raised uh, is one of the points that came up, certainly at the cross-party group meeting, but also at the round table meeting we had in my constituency. Also, I want to publicly thank the Minister for how willing he has been to engage with myself, but also the boating sector in this bill. And the sector has shared with me their, their gratitude uh, at how open and keen the Minister has been to actually have dialogue with them too. And with that in mind, I look forward to continuing that engagement, uh, as I know that the Minister is very much sympathetic to the concerns uh, of the boating sector uh, and is prepared to certainly consider the amendments. I've also raised the issue of extending the legislation to include the cruise sector, uh, as this 
would be more beneficial to my constituents. It's something that's been touched upon by uh, Ross Geary a moment ago, but also Piers has wished regarding her constituency earlier. Now, the Minister has previously indicated that this bill may not be the vehicle to deliver this, but I would ask him not to rule it out or consider uh, the additional legislation to actually deliver this. And I, I do note the Minister's reply to the committee on the 12th of January. But just to go, kind of touch one, kind of one potential complexity of this, um, whether it's a, a flat rate or a tiered rate, um, I think there would be a challenge if there's a tiered rate for the cruise sector. But in terms of a flat rate, I think the flat rate actually would benefit the cruise sector. So um, I think there's certainly, there are some areas that certainly need to be considered uh, with regards to the cruise sector. But also, finally, I, just, I do note that the, the Association of Self Scotland Self Caterers also calls for cruise ships to be included in the bill. So with that saying, also, I will conclude, but I generally want to uh, congratulate the committee for their excellent report. I want to thank uh, the Minister for bringing the bill forward and look forward to supporting it and working with them as the bill goes forward. Thank you.